All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special presentation from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and our special partners, the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I would just like to start by recognizing that the Nature Conservancy and the museum have been partnering for over 10 years to bring world-renowned scientists and conservationists to present on important environmental issues ranging from Colorado's plains to coral reefs. And tonight is no exception. We have a fantastic panel this evening. You are welcome and please do send in any questions you have in the chat. We are definitely monitoring that and we will have time for a few questions, probably not all questions, but a few questions at the end of everyone's presentation. Tonight, we're going to learn a little bit more about Colorado's newest state park, Fisher's Peak, who some people voted for there in the chat. Uh, exciting to see that as well. Our presenters tonight are Chris Pig, the senior ecologist at the Nature Conservancy here in Colorado. We have our own John Domboski, the senior curator of mammals and the director of zoology and health sciences at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And Ian Miller, our director of earth and space sciences and the associate curator of paleobotany at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So tonight I'm going to pass it off to Chris to start us off and we will uh, see you in the chat if you have any questions. Chris, go ahead. All right, thank you very much. And I'm going to take a second here and share my screen. It's wonderful for everybody to take your time and uh, be able to spend it here. And we hope that you get to learn a little bit more about this fantastic new opportunity that Coloradoans will be able to participate in in the not too distant future. Well, let me start first with um, when, when I first saw this property, it looked just like that. It was amazing how fast things happened. This property went up for sale and it wasn't the Nature Conservancy, it wasn't the Trust for Public Lands, it wasn't Colorado Parks and Wildlife, it was the town of Trinidad said, this thing has been behind our, uh, in our background for so long, we actually would like to see if we can create something new. And who do we bring to the table to figure out how we could actually purchase this property? There are 4,000 acres, not very far. And once it was for sale, the opportunity really came. So the, the, uh, the town of Trinidad approached the Trust for Public Lands and the Nature Conservancy and said, what can we create? And with that, uh, very rapidly came a partnership. The, the town of Trinidad, the Nature Conservancy, the Trust for Public Lands, Great Outdoors Colorado, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And this is a pretty amazing uh, assemblage of people. And it was uh, a great opportunity to protect 4,000 acres. But the Nature Conservancy talked to its partner, the Trust for Public Land, and said, why don't we do the whole 20,000 acres? And Trust for Public Land didn't need any urging beyond that. And that's how this whole project has developed. And so now uh, the acquisition has happened. I'll tell you a little more about that later. Uh, the, the partnership has now agreed and in early, it was only 13 months, which is an uncommonly uh, fast time for this project to happen. And I hope through this presentation tonight that you'll be able to see that this is really an important part of the landscape and it's gonna be a really important contribution to conservation. So Fisher's Peak has always been looming in the background of Trinidad, but never accessible, always private property. Uh, so this was an incredible opportunity. And one of the most amazing things is right off the bat, the partnership goals were created. And these goals were to protect and manage as a natural area, this landscape, but also to allow public access that would, and recreation that would provide for economic benefits and cultural benefits. But both of those had to occur. September 2019, Governor Polis, actually with all the funding said, this will be our next state park in Colorado, the 42nd. Uh, it was an amazing, like I said, an amazing time frame. But look, looking back just a little bit, what the beauty that we see today in this picture taken sometime around 1900 shows that the landscape was had a looming cliff and rocky outcrop behind it, but it wasn't always in the same way beautiful as we know it today. So 
this is an amazing thing, but nature has a way, and with the private land ownership, while it did protect the land from access for many people, it also nature take its course with the way that the landowners had predominantly used this land. And so uh, what we see today is nature has been going through its healing process. It's beautiful, but is it also important from a conservation viewpoint? And that's another part of this conversation that we want to have. Um, some of our first explorations were from air. When the Nature Conservancy gets involved, what we um, have to do as part of our policy and of course as part of our mission is to assess the biological values of a property. And so we were fortunate enough to be able to visit on numerous occasions uh, and from the air as well as using drone technology. So take a quick look at this, Trinidad, uh, just north of the state line, about 13 miles and Fisher's Peak is right down there uh, and abuts the state line. But the point of this is that there's a lot more conservation going on here. This is a bigger piece of property, but it's a piece of a puzzle that has really been showing progress in the last decade. And we're gonna see a lot more progress in the near future, I believe. And then looking one more, even you step out a little farther and you can see where the yellow star is on the diagram. And what that is, this Fisher's Peak State Park, all the areas on the map that share some kind of a color are either properties that are already in conservation status or will be in the not too distant future. And most of these are happening with uh, great partnerships, but also great visions that are coming from each each state that's involved and the organizations like the Nature Conservancy, Trust for Public Land, and Great Outdoors Colorado with a really good vision. Well, the regional planning that happened uh, was only a part of the whole picture. Like we said, to achieve these two goals, we've got to have a lot of, to protect and enjoy, it takes a lot of careful planning. It also takes a real commitment. And what I want to note here is that in a, in a survey that was done, a mission or a visioning statement, just to, to figure out what the people of Trinidad thought, they about 300 people participated and they were really excited about the ability to finally get access to Fisher's Peak or that landscape, but also about the recreation opportunities. But they also insisted, the majority of them, that the preservation of this world-class habitat and the inhabitants of it needed to be preserved, not to love it to death. So that's pretty critical thinking there from the town and shows a commitment, which allowed all of us to get involved. So now looking back to the past a little bit, because it's so critical that we understand that in designing conservation, I'm gonna turn it over to Ian. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that was awesome. Um, and I'm super excited to share uh, some of the deep time history of the Fisher's Peak um, area. Look at that, I'm, I'm missing an S on Fisher Peak. Notice right away, that's the way it goes, right? Okay, so for me as a geologist, so, uh, uh, Alyssa, can you, hear, can you hear me? Is it all good? Okay, great. So uh, for me as a geologist and paleontologist, I always like to sort of um, center myself on the planet and have that bigger context. So this is a shaded relief map of North America. You can see the state lines in the United, of the United States and this huge area of all this sort of crinkled land, if you will, um, are, is one of the great mountain belts on earth, the Rocky Mountains and the Sierras uh, and the basin and range in between. And what's interesting is Colorado here is nearly a thousand miles, uh, well, about 750 miles inland uh, from that mountain belt. And we're gonna go right here to the southern edge of Colorado, but what I want you to notice is that we're uh, as far east as the mountains go, essentially. So uh, this is a Google Earth image of, um, of the area, and, and Chris did a great job of showing you some of the, the land features, but I, I really wanted to point out that this is where the mountains meet the plains, and John will probably talk a lot about this, but from a physiographic sort of standpoint, here's Fisher Peak, 
we come from the flat plains up into the into the mountains here and this is the edge of the Rockies and the uh, southern uh, reaches of the Sangare de Cristos over here on uh, the western side of this picture, the left hand side. So uh, here's Fisher's Peak and it's this incredibly prominent feature and all the land around it and to the south of it that is now part of this uh, park uh, all included in this and I want to talk about the rocks that are that are there and the stories that they tell. So we're gonna to go to the bottom of that stack, the bottom of that mountain uh, to start this story. And as a geologist, we, we sort of, uh, when we make a map of rocks, we color them. Uh, and that sort of helps us figure out, uh, helps us uh, very quickly read a map for ages and the types of rocks that are there. That arrow is pointing to the, the approximate location of Fisher's Peak. And uh, it's on the Eastern edge of what we call the Ratone Basin. And this is a basin that's full of, of coals and has been economically important in the past. And um, what's interesting is it records time from when the Rockies uplifted. So the mountains to the west, the Rockies uplifted, shed all this incredible sediment out to the east and preserved um, a big chunk of time that's very important in Earth's history. So to get into that a little bit, here's a wonderful diagram of geologic time over the last almost uh, 550 million years. This is from uh, the great paleo artist, Ray Troll. And the rocks underneath uh, Fisher's Peak uh, preserve this time right at the end of the Cretaceous and the beginning of the Paleocene. So about 65, 66 million years ago. And you can see, sort of see that bracketed there on the right. And why is this so important? So if we put this in the big perspective of multicellular life on Earth, Here's a diagram that shows uh, time along the bottom, 600 million years all the way on the left, um, uh, the present day on the right, and then the numbers of families of organisms on uh, the left, so the vertical uh, axis. And you can see this, the numbers of families of organisms sort of doing this seesaw pattern. And every time you see something go up, that's diversification. And when it drops, that's one of the great extinctions in Earth's history. And what's interesting is uh, we have five of these that we recognized in time, and they are super important in the sort of course of life. And what's interesting uh, further is that Fisher's Peak preserves the time of the last great mass extinction in Earth's history, and that is the end of the Cretaceous. So I, I just want you to think about these mass extinctions. Mass extinctions are uh, events that kill at least 50% of the species on the planet. That's their definition. And they're, they're really biological filters and they're also a point of origin. So here's sort of on the left-hand side of branching tree of diversification and phylogeny. So maybe each little branch here would be a different group of animals. The extinction there in red and that sort of trims that tree, that filter. Few things make it through and they diversify into the new world. Uh, we sort of think of these as the biologic reset button. And again, the last great one happened about 66 million years ago. So when we look at life on Earth today, they all have their different evolution, evolutionary histories and uh, points of origin, but everything alive today had to have an ancestor that survived the last great mass extinction. That goes for the plants, the insects, the fishes, the birds, the lizards, the fungi, and the mammals, and the list goes on. So for, the, uh, for a long time, computer auto muted there. Um, we've, we've struggled to sort of understand the end of the Cretaceous, the extinction of the dinosaurs and the beginning of the age of mammals for a long time. And uh, for the longest time, we thought it was a gradual event until about 1980, um, uh, physicist uh, Walter Alvarez and his dad, um, also a physicist, came up with this idea that a massive asteroid hit the earth and killed the dinosaurs and was the source of the last great mass extinction. But there's still sort of two camps and they even exist today that there's this big debate of what killed the dinosaurs. Was it an asteroid or was it massive volcanoes? So the other big idea out there is that huge volcanoes in India were the source of the chemicals and ecosystem change that caused the end of the time of the dinosaurs. So uh, Fisher's Peak and uh, the Ratone pl Basin play an incredible, incredibly important role in the history of us figuring out um, when these, uh, uh, whether it was an asteroid or 
a um, or volcanoes. And so here's Fisher's Peak again. We're going to look at some rocks right at the base of that. And here's just uh, a couple of my colleagues from the National Museum in Japan uh, about three or four years ago. And they're here sampling this funny, this little white line underneath that sandstone. And that line, if we zoom in a little bit here, it's a little bit easier to see with the, uh, um, uh, with the knife for scale, the Swiss Army knife, and we'll zoom in a little bit more. And that layer records the asteroid impact that happened uh, uh, right at the time of the end of the dinosaurs. And we just didn't really have a good uh, sense of that. We had no terrestrial record. We had no on land record of this event. Uh, prior to a group of the USGS doing some seminal work in the late 80s. And they came up with, this is one of the original diagrams in 1987. You can imagine this debate in uh, paleontology and geology. Could something from outer space really come and wipe out a hugely important group of animals? And the group out of the USGS from Lakewood, Colorado, they went down there to work in the Raton Basin. And this is one of the first diagrams they published. And they found that not only that the Cretaceous rocks, there was a, a very um, distinct change right at the appropriate boundary, but it had this incredible spike in iridium. This is something that the Alvarez has noticed in the marine rocks, but hadn't found on land. And that spike in iridium has a fingerprint of an asteroid. It's an element that's common in asteroids, but not at the Earth's surface. This other side are fern spores. And they dissolved the rock, screened out all the little pollen spores, and found that right after the boundary, the entire world essentially was covered in ferns, indicating massive destruction. So they helped, and the Raton Basin played this, and the rocks right at the base of Fisher's Peak played this incredibly important role in figuring out whether or not it was an asteroid or uh, volcanoes. And we now know, or most of us uh, feel as though it's an asteroid. And so we were hit by this rock 66 million years ago, going about 150,000 miles an hour. It pulls outer space to the planet. It hits the Yucatan Peninsula and sends a shockwave and firestorm from Mexico to Alaska in five minutes. Here is uh, a reconstruction of uh, the San Juan Basin, New Mexico, so not far from the, from the Raton Trinidad area. T-Rex and Triceratops lived on the landscape, and there's the, they seem not to notice that fireball coming at them, uh, but they're toast here. Um, this thing engendered incredibly huge tidal waves that made it all the way to northern Texas. And um, one of the, the sort of main killers of the asteroid was the material that was blown back out into space. That stuff went up uh, into orbit, suborbit, and came back down within a day or so. And it superheated the atmosphere to a couple hundred degrees Celsius. And it left all these sort of beads of rock. And this is a little chunk of the boundary near um, Trinidad. And you can see those little round pebbles. Those are the beads of molten material that fell out of the sky. And this thing wiped out forests the world over. And uh, we think that that was the main killing mechanism. Ironically, it was a day after the impact. It wasn't the impact itself. Though if you were here in, in Colorado and that thing hit in Mexico, you probably didn't survive the impact. It's that much, it's that, it's that powerful. So we went from this amazing world of the Cretaceous. Dinosaurs are incredibly dominant. Uh, there are thousands of named species. They dominated the planet for 150 million years. And they all died out in a moment. And that story of extinction and the subsequent recovery of these mammals that ended up taking over the planet plays out in the base of Fisher's Peak. So now, just to finish up here before I hand over to John, I want to talk a little bit about the rocks at, top, at the top. So, you see this, you know, this incredibly um, uh, a majestic mountain. It's actually the largest, it's the highest point east of I-25. So it's actually the highest point east of the Rocky Mountains, anywhere in the United States, sitting almost at 10,000 feet. And those rocks at the top have a very different story than those, those treed slopes that have the KT boundary in it below. So I think we're going to go back to our geologic map here. So uh, on our geologic map, we can see the different colors, but those sort of maroon colors are basalt flows. So basalt is the kind of uh, material that gets erupted from the Hawaiian Islands and spills out over the land. And if you look at Fisher's Peak, and we saw this uh, image, I think, from Chris, uh, you start to see a characteristic morphology. And it turns out these things are basalt flows that cap the top of the peak and the area behind it. 
but how does a basalt flow on the top of a peak? That just doesn't make any sense, right? It should go down a valley and uh, form the base of a valley. So this is one of the most incredible examples. There, there are actually quite a few of them out there, um, but of inverted topography. So imagine time one here, and you have a valley, and, a va and in that valley, the basalt flows, fills it up, it hardens and the basalt is much, much harder than the rock around it. And then the rock erodes, leaving the basalt at the top. And in fact, that is exactly what happened um, at Fisher's Peak. And so now when you look at this, you can see those layered um, uh, flows. There's actually nearly 800 feet of this material at the top and it was filling ancient valleys. And now it's the top of a mountain. Um, and it forms this incredible uh, physiographic boundary between the plains to the east and the mountains to the west. I'm gonna leave it uh, to John to talk a little bit about uh, the ecosystems and the kinds of uh, um, organisms that live there. Okay, uh, thanks Ian for going into deep time talking about stuff like mass extinctions when actually we should be celebrating that we're putting aside some land for a state park. So that's what I'm excited about there. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is really neat. Um, I've been in Colorado for 14 years and I can remember the first time I kind of drove down I-25 towards New Mexico to go do some field work down that way. Uh, first time I saw Fisher's Peak, it's so iconic. And my first thought, of course, as a biologist was like, who owns that land and how can I get access to it? And I can remember looking at maps going, oh, this looks private. I mean, there's state parks around, which I'm gonna that, uh, adjoin it that I'll talk about here too. But um, this is really exciting. Now, when uh, the museum was approached uh, from Chris about talking about this Fisher's Peak uh, State Park, uh, part of me was like, well, I personally haven't done any work in there. But the thing is, uh, our museum does have a, a tie to it from almost 25 years ago. And that has to do with some work by a former uh, curator of mammals. And I'll talk a little bit about her work. And also when we were discussing this, uh, just uh, we were talking about what we were gonna talk about, Chris mentioned how important museum collections are to a lot of this work. So all he had to do was give me a little bit of a, an inroads into that. So some of what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit about our collections and how they fit into some of the work that went on 25 years ago and uh, how we have those specimens that have formed a, somewhat of a basis for why this area in Fisher's Peak is so important. So I will share my screen here. And we'll get right into it right here. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, our museum does have a tie. We don't have a recent, we weren't part of the partnerships recently that led to the formation of Fisher Peaks as a state park, but we do have uh, uh, deeper ties that go back about 25 years, as I mentioned. And a lot of that has to do with collections. So Many of you who are members have maybe been to a member's night or been visited the museum and behind the scenes, we have 4.3 million specimens and objects. 1.27 million, almost 40%, uh, um, are actually in zoology collections there. And what this image shows is an image of our uh, state-of-the-art facility we have where we store zoological uh, specimens. So you see a lot of mounted, uh, uh, birds and mammals here. Now our collections, and this is purely zoological here at the museum, are about eight collections. Everything from mammals, which I'm the curator of, birds, you've got insects, marine invertebrates. Uh, let me put a pointer on here. Whoops. This right here with uh, the ugly mug there is our parasite collection. That's just a pinworm. So we have a large uh, parasite collection that uh, is actually tied to our mammals and birds. So every time a mammal and bird comes in, we take the parasites off and we have this uh, collection with them. So we have about, uh, we have eight collections. Five of them are major, meaning they're, they're large. Uh, the insect collection is almost a million. That's most of our collection right there. 
Uh, spiders are big. Uh, many of you know Paula Cushing, our uh, curator of arachnology. Uh, we have a large, uh, one of the top 10 arachnology uh, collections. So all these, for the most part, uh, are a good example of the biodiversity. Even though it's from seven continents, a lot of it is focused on Colorado and the Great Plains and the Rockies. And our collections get used quite heavily. And that's going to be the lead into some of this uh, relationship to Fisher's Peak. But they get used quite heavily. I mean, until the pandemic hit, we were doing a lot of activity where uh, materials used by the scientific uh, community. And that's across a lot of different uh, disciplines of science and uses. So a lot of people, uh, you see a mammal skull up there in the top left that uh, people do morphology. They make measurements on it. They may want a bone sample to do stable isotope analysis. Um, we do a lot of tissue samples that what looks like little tissue uh, tubes over there. That's probably one of our biggest uh, loan activity is people doing genomics and genetics that lead to phylogeny, phylogenies, evolutionary trees like in the middle there. Um, so a lot of work on that, particularly with the molecular revolution, if you will, over the last 30 years. We still have people coming uh, to look at our old study skins there. There's some chipmunks in the bottom left there. And uh, people are looking at pelage, color polymorphisms. Uh, sometimes these are older specimens up to 100 years old that they want us to clip a little bit off for uh, destructive sampling so they can do DNA analysis. And the technology is there for that. I'd mentioned we have a parasite collection. We get a lot of requests now for uh, parasites because people are in a, interested in co-divergence, co-evolution of parasites and their hosts. And with a lot going on with pandemics, and uh, climate change, people are real interested in how parasites are tracking hosts and what sort of vectors for diseases they might be carrying. Uh, right there in the middle at the bottom also, big thing we do, not so much anymore recently with the pandemic is a lot of outreach where we bring people behind the scenes to see our collections and kind of um, show why collections are so important to asking big uh, questions in science. Now, another real interesting one, and I would say this is how our collections, uh, and this might be surprising, are really used is uh, data, big data in this uh, 21st century. So for example, up at the top left, you see a tag from a wolf from 1918, that's in our collection. And the data off that tag has been transcribed into our database. We have two databases, Arctos and Symbiota. These are internal databases uh, that we use to manage our collections. All that data then publishes or gets fed to these huge portals. There's about 11 of them right here. Your tax dollars pay for some of this information to be uh, hosted and it's all public. You can find all the information from our collections as well as a bunch of other museum collections uh, in many of these portals here. Probably the biggest one is uh, called GBIF. It's got 1.5 billion uh, records of specimens, be they plants, be they mammals, and there's even paleo being moved into a lot of that now. So uh, it's, it's really the record of the world's biodiversity, 1.5 billion records, pretty amazing. Now, all that data, uh, in our databases can be geo-referenced, and what I'm showing on this whether you want to call it cluttered or pretty map here, that's Colorado. And that's about 50,000 records of mammals and birds out of our database. And this, uh, all these records uh, come from the last 150 years. So that's from the 1870s at the present right there. So what you're looking at is it goes from like blue to red. If you want to say cold to hot, uh, you see more records. If we were able to uh, uh, zoom in, we'd get more granularity and see more of these records across uh, the state of Colorado. And that's just Colorado. I just pulled that up right there. As you see, a lot of the records are from the Denver area. And then if I look, if you're looking at the red dots there, you see a lot that actually speaks to the history of the museum and places where there were expeditions and mammals and birds were collected. And if you look down here, which I'll get to, this is kind of our area of interest tonight. And you see some red dots. Uh, around the Trinidad area and the 
Raton Basin right there. And uh, that's uh, some of the work that our museum has done over the years down in the Fisher's Peak area. Well, uh, another interesting thing here too, and it shows you that biologists can be lazy. Is if you look on the Eastern Plains there, Notice how a lot of the uh, records just track the uh, highway system there. So biologists just travel looking for roadkill there. Okay, this map's kind of cluttered and it's hard to see the topography underneath. So I've got this other image right here that's kind of zoomed out and shows that area. Uh, there's Trinidad and uh, Raton right there. And so you're seeing a little bit of New Mexico and what you're seeing like Ian showed earlier with the geology as well as the mountains is you're seeing the Southern Rocky Mountains to your left. Most of you are familiar with this. And then you're seeing the plains off to your east. And what is really interesting about this is, uh, and why Fisher's Peak in that area is so interesting because when I look at this as a biologist and the type of work I do with is molecular genetics, I look at this map and since a lot of my work's up in montane regions, I see there's mountain ranges, but they look like islands to me. So it's, it, it's an archipelago, a terrestrial archipelago. So I'm looking at that going, well, we need to get to this isolated mountain range. We need to go here because there's probably a lot of differentiation between populations of animals that live there. And what happens here with near Fisher's Peak, which draws my eyes, is you see a little bit of an arm going off of the Southern Rockies from the I-25 corridor and it kind of juts out into the Eastern Plains and it makes it almost, it gets into Oklahoma. And this is where, uh, why this area is so cool down there is uh, that it juts out and it's a little bit of a kind of an island system out there. And also this would be a place where you might see, and it does happen, uh, mammals that live in the Southern Rockies, montane mammals also end up you know, a little further east. As Ian said, it's uh, kind of the highest point east of I-25. And so you're going to find some mammals that you would not find, say, if you went straight north up to Rocky Ford out on the plains. You're not going to find those montane mountains uh, animals there. So as a biologist uh, that really, uh, who studies uh, geography and where animals are distributed, this really speaks to me. So we can uh, come in closer here. This really shows, a, a satellite image shows these mesas here that are really stand out there. There's Fisher's Peak up at the top towards Trinidad. Down here is Raton Pass in the New Mexico-Colorado border. And then you see uh, the mesa system right there that Ian was talking about. And what you also see is uh, kind of two major ecosystems meet right there. You have that jutting of the southern Rockies coming out. Uh, not so much alpine tundra there, but some subalpine forest, montane forest there. And it meets uh, basically the eastern plains of Colorado up in your top right there where it gets uh, browner there. So this is really neat. This comes out like this. And this is why it's been of interest to a lot of biologists over the years. And the sampling points you see there, those are from our database and you see some in blue and yellow. And what that is, is most of that is work that was done by one of our biologists 25 years ago, uh, Sherry Jones, who did work down in uh, the state parks down there that are adjacent to Fisher's Peak here. And what came out of that work, and I was familiar with, was uh, a publication in 2002 of the work from 1995 and 1996 that Sherry published. And what she found is she did survey work over two years. It was focused on mammals, and that's what you're gonna to get tonight from me is the, the mammalian perspective around Fisher's Peak. And what she found was 31 species uh, confirmed in, in the area right south of Fisher's Peak. And uh, these specimens are in our collection. She also said there were probably 57 additional species nearby. 37 were probably very likely to occur and just hadn't been found. Uh, and 20 were less likely. The 20 less likely are really species of mammals you'd find out on the Eastern Plains. So they're not gonna probably be right there, uh, the Fisher's Peak area, uh, James John wildlife areas and uh, New Mexico border there. So uh, to kind of get into this, and uh, I wanted to give you a couple examples of some of the, the neat mammals that are found down there. Um, 
what Sherry found of those 31 mammals is you can kind of lump them into big, small, and medium. Uh, you've got some larger mammals down there. Uh, you've got your black bear, uh, your elk are down there. Uh, there's also uh, mountain lions nearby as well. You've got your medium variety of mammals here, coyotes, beavers, raccoons, pretty common stuff that you might see also around the, the Denver area as well. Uh, and some of these uh, species are, are pretty widespread throughout the state anyway, particularly coyotes are found all over. But where uh, you're gonna hear my bias is because I'm a small mammal biologist and also where I think a lot of the interest should be <laughs> is uh, with your small mammals. And that really makes up most of the diversity in that area. Sherry found that, that's gonna be the same for Fisher's Peak. It's also the same for Colorado. And it's the same for the world. There's about 6,000 species of mammals across the planet. And if you're a mammal on this planet, odds are you're either a bat or a rat because that's most of the species diversity across the planet. And the Fisher's Peak area has rats and bats. And also other rodents as well as uh, some, some of my favorite up there in the top right, that's a shrew. It's not a rodent, but it is a mammal. And their diversity in the state is uh, pretty high actually. So uh, you've got these small mammals and I've got a couple examples I wanna go through, but I also wanna point out that Chris sent me a couple checklists of uh, the Fisher of the Crazy French Ranch, which was the private land and now we've got Fisher's uh, Peak State Park. So he sent me a uh, couple checklist of mammals as well as some birds, as well as some invertebrates. This is uh, sort of a summary of the mammals of that area as of a, couple, a month ago. And it, it's similar to what Sherry found in her work, about 34 species observed at, on the land right there. And there's probably about another, uh, you know, up to 50 species of mammal in the area. And some of them just haven't been captured yet or found or seen or observed, but they're probably around, particularly with the bats. The, the bats, there's probably a lot more diversity of uh, bats in the area. Bats are always a tough one. They're nocturnal. Uh, they're uh, hard to find sometimes. Some of them migrate in and out of the state. So uh, there's probably more diversity there. Now, some quick examples here in my remaining time of things that interest me. And one thing I want to point out is uh, Colorado is, has always been interesting to me because we get... Um, a good mixture of species, particularly mammals that have a more northerly distribution and go all the way to Alaska and Canada, tree line up there. And then we also get the influence of mammals that come up from Mexico into Arizona and New Mexico. And a lot of them meet in Colorado. So you'll get kind of major lineages, northern and southern in Colorado. In addition, you're gonna, you do get some eastern and western, you know, plains animals and uh, montane animals. But uh, that southern influence uh, will really, I want to draw that to your attention as I show you a couple examples here, because you're also going to see it here in uh, the Fisher Peaks area. So one of them is uh, just your kind of a nondescript small mammal, uh, Mogion vole, uh, Microtus, the genus it belongs to. There's multiple examples in Colorado and the west of other species. And if you look at the distribution map there, uh, you'll see that it's uh, distributed throughout Arizona and New Mexico and just makes it up into Colorado. In fact, the first one was found in Mesa Verde National Park, and then it was picked up around the Fisher Peaks area. So it, it's known and it's got kind of a, a, what you would call fragmented distribution in the south there. Another one is, uh, this is one that might be dear to Chris here is a, a hognose skunk. So for those of you who live in Colorado, we've got four species of skunk. You probably don't know much about this one. Uh, you probably know about the striped skunk. It's the one that you might find in Denver, the big city. There's two species of spotted skunk, eastern and western we have. They're, they're uncommon, but people do see them. But this one is interesting. Uh, Hognose skunk, you can see it's got a distribution going all the way down in Central America, America and it just makes it up into Colorado. And there's only about 12 uh, specimens in museums from Colorado. We have some, they were collected up almost 100 years ago uh, in our collection now. And this species is occasionally seen in Colorado. 
Uh, and Chris uh, actually found one roadkill just south of Raton Pass in New Mexico in 2003. So they do occasionally get here. The state's been interested in kind of what they're doing. Are they expanding? Are they doing okay? Uh, and adjacent states too, uh, Kansas and Oklahoma have been looking into this uh, species because it's at the periphery, northern periphery of its range. Here's another one. Uh, this one you may know about. All you have to do is Google and you'll get a, a lot of hits on this because of conservation concerns. This is the New Mexico jumping mouse, Zapus Hudsonius luteus, uh, or Zapus luteus. Uh, because there's been recent molecular work, I was actually involved in it, that had a couple papers that have shown that this is a very divergent species of jumping mouse that occurs, and you see on the map, once again, that southern uh, distribution into Arizona and New Mexico. It's probably in fragmented habitats. It is, its habitat is very much tied to uh, riparian zones, which are in the Fisher Peaks area. So this species, or subspecies, has been picked up in that area. But it is of conservation concern. You may have here in Colorado have heard a lot about Preble's jumping mouse. That's in the news has been in the news in the past, but honestly, this one right here, New Mexico jumping mouse is even more uh, unique from a genetic perspective and goes deeper in its, its divergence here. So really neat animal. They live close to water, they hibernate, uh, so neat animals. But one thing that Chris didn't have on his most recent checklist here, and this has uh, really um, confused me over the years, is this. Now, I don't know if, how many of you have driven up Raton Pass, I-25, and I'm not sure if this sign's still here, but over the years I've driven it, I've seen the sign, I've always been confused. I've been in a car with other mammologists. We laugh, we have discussions about it, and here is why. So I see this, and it's a bear. It doesn't really look like a black bear to me, and uh, the three arrows point to a slight hump, the long neck and that kind of dish concave uh, face right there. So it's a bear crossing right there near Fisher's Peak. And if you look at those characteristics, that's actually what you're kind of seeing more of. It looks more like a polar bear, but it also has grizzly bear, brown bear characteristics. So Chris, I think on your list, you need to put the pizzly or the growler on your list because it must be around the area. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but at least Colorado Department of Transportation thinks it's nearby. So, but uh, there it is. So that, I don't know if that uh, sign's there anymore, but it's always uh, perplexed me and humored me at a, <laughs> for a long time. So to wrap up here, you know, I talked a lot about mammals. Uh, what about other animals? Well, Chris gave me some checklists, been about 101 of maybe 138 species of bird that could be in the area observed and identified. And then if you want to get in the invertebrates, that could be a whole nother talk and a lot of work. Uh, he gave me a checklist of about 450 at least identified invertebrates, spiders, insects, millipedes, and who knows how many are in the area uh, that way. I mean, and that's pretty classic that typically invertebrates tend to be understudied in most areas. We know a lot about mammals and birds, but less about uh, the invertebrates. And if they've been doing any sort of amphibian or reptile surveys, uh, I'd, we'd have to defer to Chris if that kind of work's been done. That's another major vertebrate group there. Uh, last two things, there's probably more species of bat in the area, I mentioned that, and probably some small rodents and shrews that would also pop up. And some of that would be, they're tough to tell, they're nocturnal. Sometimes you have to look at specimens. Sometimes you have to do DNA work to do that. And then, Here's something I think that's really interesting. A part of it is the kind of work I do with molecular is uh, even if you identify like you know there's a shrew there or a vole there, there's a good chance that uh, it could be a cryptic species by looking at, once you look at the genetics or the lineages there. So for example, in the area of Fisher's Peak, there's pine squirrels or red squirrels, chicories, whatever you want to call them. Uh, many of you probably don't know, but a couple of years ago, a paper came out and says there's, that pine squirrels in Colorado should be subdivided into two species. So uh, the one in the south would be a new species that probably occurs at, a, uh, at Fisher's Peak. They've been there, it's just the genetics says it's a major uh, lineage there. 
Same with the chipmunks I study, uh, bats as well. We don't know a whole lot about them. So a lot of that is, uh, that uh, the Fisher's Peak area is probably ripe for looking at some of these species more in depth because it's at a really unique crossroads between northern and southern lineages. And uh, so a lot remains to be done now. And that's what I have, and I'll turn it back to Chris here. So let me get out of here, stop the share, and I'll mute myself. All right, uh, I am trying to get my computer to listen to my command here. There we go. Okay, well, thank you guys. This is really great because the, the, the uh, lay of the land, the geology, the geomorphology really has a great deal to do, uh, not only with what lives there, but what could live there in the future. And we're not gonna talk about that until uh, uh, another session later on, but it's really important that we think of this property not just as a property, but as a linkage or connection. I did see some notes in the chat about that, and maybe we can get to those questions at the end about the I-25 corridor. But what I wanna talk quickly about, since this is a field, um, kind of a virtual field trip, is some of the actual stuff we've seen out there. And the stuff that I'm talking about is really, uh, we need information on the things that are most likely to be good indicators of success of the conservation part of this, and also what would likely be most impacted if we didn't take care and do our jobs right. And that's just really a specialty. And so when John's talking about the biogeography, we create lists, that we call them hypotheses of what might be there. We make great use of both the geological information, key types of, of geology that might indicate some rare plants or other uh, sensitive habitats. And then we also use the records and we made tremendous uh, use of the records and some of those uh, online databases were not available 25 years ago. And so we had great opportunity to look at the museum work from all the local museums in Colorado, but most particularly from the Denver Museum. So it's what we call a rapid ecological assessment. And uh, we, it always works out this way in conservation. You think you've got two, three, four years to do a study on a property. And our uh, real estate team, along with all the other partners I've mentioned, have done a tremendous job, got this property transferred quickly. So things happened a lot more quickly. So I'm glad we talked about it as a rapid ecological assessment. But what we've been able to do is there's a there's a, a significant group of people who have studied ecology, natural history, different kinds of ologies from bugs and bats and birds and all these groups. And we were able to assemble counting, uh, if you count all the people involved in this, about 45 people that have participated in trying to figure out what lives there. And again, part of this is our commitment to making sure that we do the best job that we can in really designing this place around success. And if you remember, the two pillars of success are, we've got to conserve the nature there, and we've got to put in compatible recreation that really does uh, come up as a high class of recreation. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, we don't know uh, uh, what that might mean. It's still in the planning process. We're doing the biological part of the assessment right now. No decisions have been made about this at this point in time. So we still have a good template for, for working. Um, I do want to mention a couple of the, the, uh, the Colorado Natural Heritage Program led by, by uh, David Anderson, the Nature Conservancy, uh, you can blame me for that one, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, Ed Schmall, Crystal Dryling, Mike Trujillo, uh, Matt Schultz, these guys are really fantastic. A bunch of ornithologists out there who are really volunteering their time. Uh, some notables, uh, Adam Petrie, uh, Kathy Dunning, uh, Tim Chrysler from Trinidad, if you're on, Chris. Uh, uh, so Colorado State University entomology students. Um, we have botanists from uh, various herbaria, uh, lepidopterists, many of which are, most of which are actually uh, volunteers in doing this, they're very expert. And then a great naturalist in the Eastern Plains area in particular, Mike Figs. I just wanted to note those names. 
And uh, most of these people are actually spending, uh, volunteering their time. Uh, Great Outdoors Colorado, the Nature Conservancy, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife also supported a lot of this work. So I wanted to just mention that because the effort is not me going out in the field and, and looking for these things, although I'm fortunate enough to get out there some, um, but it is about can we bring together a new kind of a partnership to actually do these assessments in a way that really will inform and allow us to commit and measure our success in these planning processes. So the rest of this is really, um, you know, we, we spent nights in the building down there looking at maps and studying and determining where we thought the most important places might might be. We studied the geology and looked for shales, which often have rare things. We, we did our homework on this process, and then we actually got in the field. And um, one of the things I wanna mention is, is that, that it really has made a difference in the world by having wildlife cameras to be able to send out. They work 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, that especially if you actually get the batteries changed, I found out. Um, but some of the things that we've discovered doing that and a little bit of other types of survey work um, or, or as you can see, there's a lot of predators out there. This proper property has been private and quiet for a long time. So the mountain lions are, it's not hard to find the tracks. And of course, you, the elk, which John was talking about, and throughout their life cycle, calving is going on. We have videos from our wildlife cameras that show them fighting. And of course, we can hear the beautiful bugling there. And the hog-nosed skunk is kind of a surprise. For many years, nobody was seeing these things in the state, an occasional roadkill. But we came up with those uh, on the property in both set of cameras. I'll just mention that there's two types of studies going on out there right now. Uh, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, of course, is very interested in uh, the, the way that the larger mammals in particular are using the habitat. So they have uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 60 or 70 cameras randomly placed out there, which are taking pictures and actually seeing how much activity occurs. Um, the, the Nature Conservancy's cameras are set at specific locations that might attract species like springs, game trails and things. So we have a good coverage of those. And uh, it was a wonderful surprise, but with Tegan May uh, from our office in the Nature Conservancy, we got a little trapping in last year. We haven't been able to get to the actual live trapping this year, but we were fortunate enough to, to locate a uh, New Mexico meadow jumping mouse, an, an endangered species, as John was talking about, that really does need some solid conservation. So those are some of the, the species that will help us figure out how to design this place so that the recreation truly is compatible uh, as we work through the planning process. Um, here in the bird work, uh, something that's familiar to many people, those big cliffs um, are not barren and they have a lot of interesting uh, organisms near them and um, among those are the peregrine falcons and uh, Ed Schmall just reported to us that his technician and he have seen a young fledgling on the edge of the cliffs this year so that's successful. Another bird that we found to be fairly common thanks to our uh, nocturnal birders out there is the flammulated owl. And the flammulated owl is particularly important because it has specific habitat requirements. And so when we're out there on these ridge tops and listening across, uh, it's such a beautiful sound to hear their uh, fairly low but regular hooting in the area. And it turns out that they're quite common in there. And I'll show you why in a minute with some of the forest pictures. And then the other birds, which are a warbler, a ground nesting warbler. They get their name from having a, a nest shaped like an oven. It's right on the ground. Uh, and so they're particularly good indicators of disturbance uh, so that if you walk through their habitat, they're gonna spend time uh, harassing you and trying to get you to leave that area. And that is going to be you know, a good indicator for just how much we can assure wildlife that it has a quiet place in parts of the property to actually survive. So the birds, so you saw the number of birds, it's a great place. It's, it's, over, it's about 3,000 feet from the lowest point to the top of the cliffs up there, and so it's a really big dramatic habitat. And of course, birds don't have any problem getting there, it just has to have the right habitat conditions. The invertebrates are pretty remarkable 
Uh, and uh, as John said right off the bat, there, there's, there are many, many more of these things out there than, than we have the time to discover. But with people like Eric Eaton, uh, one of the co-authors or the author of the uh, Insects to North America, uh, helping out out there, we have this tremendous thing. He and his wife and then uh, numerous other people uh, uh, Christian Nunes from Boulder is out there with some experts looking at other butterflies. And I want to mention this particularly because there are four subspecies of butterflies, and let's just take them as populations that look different than the rest of them, that live only in this area. Now, not on this property, but Capulene Volcana, the Sierra Grande, the Raton Mesa, and all these areas. It's another good indicator of just what John was talking about, that the biogeography can be used as a separator. It leaves, it, it leaves things in these islands or archipelagos and they can differentiate over time. This particular one is a day flying moth. It's called the police car moth, which I think is a wonderful name for it. But it's particularly interesting day flying moth. I'm just using it to represent the more than 450 species of invertebrates that have been identified out there. But what about some of the vegetation types? Because um, from that picture that I showed in the very beginning about how desolate some of the slopes were on the property around the, the turn of the past century, um, we have been. Um, very much surprised and amazed to go through the property and find pockets. And some of them are rather large pockets of this older growth or mature timber. These ponderosa pine trees, uh, we have aged a few of them roughly, but we've aged them. And some of them are over 250 years old, which is not by ponderosa pine standards very old, but by this landscape, it's pretty dramatic. And what's important about these older growth habitat types is they have unique niches or parts of the habitat that these species all use. And in this case, the flammulated owl, it nests in a hole in the tree. Now it could be made by a woodpecker or it could be a tree limb that broke off and left a cavity in the tree. And there are many, many other species. So there's a high number of species of cavity dwellers in here because of the structure of these trees. Uh, they wouldn't be, many of them would not be great timber trees at all but they are wonderful hotels for all the wildlife out there. But not only the, the pine, but these gamble oaks in there, we came across a number of pockets of these gamble oaks and some Doug fir that are pretty amazing as well. And the Douglas fir over 200 years old. And some of these uh, oaks are well over 250 to 300 years old. Uh, and so this, this, ha this landscape has had a diverse climate, a diverse fire regime, and these forests, which are just uh, wonderfully diverse habitats, and also a little odd for Colorado. Normally this gamble oak is a shrub or a small, very small tree where it occurs. So to see it like this has been really wonderful. It's also a great habitat for cavity nesting birds, as you might um, might think from seeing this picture. And then the botanist out there with Dina Clark from the Sea Herbarium. Uh, we've got other people, Mike Figs out there, Nan Letter uh, doing some botany work. And so there's some pretty rare plants. All of the plants on this, of these three plants are known from about a hundred places in the world or less. The one in the upper left is a ragweed, which uh, for those of us who have allergies may not be a fond name, but it's a very unique one. It's called uh, the capuline ragweed. And it's a very rare species known from fewer than 10 places in the world, all of them in this local area. The one in the lower left is Herichia horrida, which is kind of funny because the name actually works the other way. It's the horrid Herichia, so go figure, but it's an obvious and aster-like plant. And uh, it's endemic to this area uh, near Vermejo Park, near the, well, this whole Vermejo Basin basically is where this plant is only known from. And then at the base of some of these cliffs, not only do we have some interesting geological phenomena, but we, we've discovered these uh, um, mustards that grow up there just in certain places and they are highly restrictive in terms of where they live in their habitat requirements. So, you can imagine how important this information is going to be in talking about where to access, when to access, 
how much access and all those as we talk about doing the conservation part of this. It's a big property and there's no doubt in my mind that there'll be a lot uh, of, of activity and a lot of success in actually achieving the two pillars, the conservation part and the access. So basically, um, this information is just to show you that uh, this team of 45 people that have been working out there and, and uh, hope this, this year has been a little bit slow with the virus, there's been a lot less activity than we had anticipated. So good thing that we were able to build on the previous information and really get uh, some good things going now. But I wanna close up with this. Um, Fisher's Peak is an icon. And it's a landscape mark. Like John, I can remember my first trip down I-25 into New Mexico and saying, oh my gosh, who owns that? Um, and it's an icon because of its geological history. It didn't just show up as a, as a statue for us to admire. And, and that's such an important part, not only of our history that we could understand better and, and be able to appreciate more, but it's also, um, it, it's, it's a part of what shapes the nature that we have today. So formations of rock and their erosion that happened many millions of years ago are now unique habitats for some plants and animals that we need to take care of. Um, there's a great diversity out there as a result of that landform. I mean, it's incredible going from pinyon juniper, arid lands at one side to Douglas fir, uh, cold, moist, and aspen forest at the top, and of course these majestic cliffs. This area is truly loved by the community. Uh, they are so excited about it, and they should be excited about it. It should be a place that they can visit. Um, the partnership here is incredible, and it's just, this would not have happened with this amazing partnership, especially happened as quickly as it did, and with the governor, um, part of his wild ideas, part of this is wanting to get people to appreciate our natural history and our geological history, as well as the other parts of our life here, uh, by getting people out there. It's going to take partnerships. And uh, uh, in addition to that, this discovery that we've been able to do out there is built on the past knowledge, and so I can't overemphasize being able to access that. In fact, one of the most interesting uh, documents that we looked at was the original land surveys of about 1870 and they described very roughly but they described the vegetation and it is remarkably similar to what we see out there today. We have detailed information, now we can start doing the robust planning instead of starting with just a wish list of what might have been found out there. And finally, what, what the promise of this process, and we hope will be a, a kind of a new model for how some of these things are done, is getting people engaged in it so we can gather the information that will design for nature and for people to learn and enjoy these landscapes. So with that, I thank my colleagues and I thank all of you for coming here. Um, I can't tell you that you can go visit this park right now. I'm not in control of it, but the governor has said, let's push really hard to have it either in sometime in 2021 and hopefully earlier in 2021 when there'll be the first trail or two open. Thank you. That was great. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, we are getting tons of comments here in the chat. Um, and we do have a couple of minutes to ask a few questions of each of our panelists. Um, let's go ahead and we, I just want to acknowledge um, our panelists are not involved in uh, the archeological history of Fisher's Peak. Um, there's definitely a lot to learn there um, and they feel free to speak to it if you, if you know about it, um, but that's definitely something that we acknowledge uh, is happening down there around Fisher's Peak as well. And we have some questions about the history of Fisher's Peak. Um, feel free to look those up, but we're gonna stick with our biodiversity and conservation focus here this evening, but there is much more. We acknowledge that for sure. So our first question, um, I'm gonna shoot over to Ian. Are there places that we can see those clearly defined boundaries uh, around that Fisher's Peak State Park area? Yes, uh, you can see them at like 65 miles an hour on I-25, right out your window. Uh, it's pretty incredible. The, the road um, 
the highway goes right through the KT boundary and it's a white stripe and a coal bed. And so if you know what you're looking for, it really stands out. And then there are a number of field guides and things like that you can look up online that'll help direct you to places where you can go put your finger on the boundary. And I think in fact, there's one uh, uh, specifically designed public access spot just outside the town of Raton on the New Mexico side uh, that you can go see uh, the boundary. Uh, but it outcrops all over the place and yep, Look for it when you're blasting down I-25. Awesome. We definitely will. All right. This question is from Michael, and I'll open it to any of our panelists. Um, maybe all of you can speak to this a little bit. Does I-25 act as a biological barrier um, at all to that arm you were talking about that juts out from the mountain systems to the west? Um, I, I can go a little bit with that. Uh, so. You know, for a long time, we've known that the road kill on that section of interstate is very high for our state. Um, New Mexico Fish and Game uh, has been working on fencing to keep the animals from crossing. Uh, our Department of Transportation and the Division of Wildlife, or Colorado Parks and Wildlife, rather, uh, are working now on how to go about this. I do want to say that, uh, is it a barrier? You know, it depends on the organism and these are tough things, but even with the high kill rate, we probably should describe it as a filter at this point in time, but it is challenging. And I would suspect that either uh, uh, maybe genetically, but at least ecologically, it needs to be addressed so that the wildlife can actually cross successfully, both ecologically and evolutionarily. Right. Uh, all right. I'll give this one to John. Um, you talked a lot about the collections that the museum has. I know they're super extensive. Um, are there plans for collections from this specific area to be deposited somewhere for other researchers to use in their studies? Say yes, John. Say yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I mean, uh, number one, uh, some of that material I talked about that was collected 25 years ago, that's in our collections now. So the uh, small mammals uh, that Sherry Jones collected, they're in our collection. There's actually tissue samples with them. She had the foresight to look into the future on that, even back in the mid-90s. And so it's uh, great material. And some of that material has been used over the years, particularly around some of these uh, species of concern like the New Mexico jumping mouse and just jumping mice in general in the state. So we do have a fair number of those that come in from survey work. And I think just, I'm trying to remember, I think just recently before the pandemic, I got a couple New Mexico jumping mice that were incidental casualties on some trapping area right near Fisher's Peak and they're in our collection now. So um, we do have that material and it's, uh, that's how, that's one of the uses of our uh, collection. So when people have a, a question, you know, they're asking, is this thing unique or not? Should it be conserved? Uh, really one way to start with that is to go right to the specimens that people are talking about and uh, study them again, whether it's with genetics, morphology, you name it. And now we're moving into the genomics there. So uh, that's even getting, uh, we're getting even more insight into that. Great, thank you. All right, one last question. Um, what are some things that we can do as Colorado citizens to help protect this conservation in these um, areas? Either of my colleagues could start this. I'll just say that I think we need to, um, we, we know that our habitat for wildlife is declining. And we know that both our will, our ability, and our interest in getting outside is growing every year. So this idea of designing um, our protection of lands around these two kinds of pillars that we're talking about, not just the economics, that's a great benefit and a stabilizer for something like Trinidad, and we look forward to that. But also, if we're gonna do this, there's, there, there can't be the true kind of compromises where somebody loses. We've gotta design it very well. And that's why we hope that this kind of partnership will grow that uh, relationships with the museums and, and other organizations can help it. But the, the key is going to be um, actually designing all of this so that there are true successes on both sides. 
And I'll just jump in here. I mean, basically from a, my perspective as a biologist and a biologist that's a curator at a large natural history museum with collections, as I told you, that go back 150 years, particularly in my realm here, that uh, any kind of planning that goes around into setting aside lands, I mean, there's so many different variables that go in and there's so many different reasons why people want to preserve land, but at least from my perspective, uh, our collections and the work that was done in the past can really inform decisions made uh, now when we plan for these uh, uh, lands to be set aside or protected, or we want to say, well, we want to protect this area because it's got so many unique species of plants, animals, you name it. Well, a lot of that is from, we know that from uh, museum collections. So I am a little biased here, but I will say that's how uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science can inform a lot of these decisions. And I would like to think that, uh, you know, those mammals that were collected 25 years ago by Sherry Jones had some role in even Fisher's Peak and the areas around that, and that part of the state and part of Northern New Mexico as well. And I guess I will say something too from the geologic standpoint, and we're, we're so fortunate here in Colorado and really the West to have incredible geology and paleontology at the surface. And there's a concept out there called geoheritage, and it's becoming more popular here in the United States, and it's this idea that we conserve uh, these incredibly important geologic outcrops that tell us something about our collective past uh, for everybody to see and everybody to access. Um, it's quite popular in Europe and other places around the world, but it hasn't quite gotten the traction here. But we have places that are like it, like Dinosaur Ridge with the incredible uh, footprints outside of Denver and other places like that. And there's no doubt that the exposures of the KT boundary, the, the actual layer of material that fell out of the sky from the asteroid impact 66 million years ago qualifies as that. It's just one of the more remarkable uh, sort of events in Earth's history and is preserved right there at Fisher's Peak. So um, uh, I think as Coloradans, we can recognize that and visit it and maybe not dig it all up as always a good thing. And, uh, um, but at any rate, uh, that would be the, maybe the geologic that's fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, we are running out of time uh, this evening, um, but if any of the panelists would like to share any of their final thoughts here about Fisher's Peak, we have a minute or two for that as well. You two go ahead. I'll close her out. How about that? I'll just jump in there and say uh, thanks, Chris and the Nature Conservancy for letting us uh, chime in here from uh, Ian and I. And uh, to everybody out there, I can't wait till the park's accessible. I mean, once again, I've been driving down there for years going, how can I get on that property? Well, now uh, the states will let us visit. So I'm looking very forward to it. It's a really unique area of the state. And if you haven't been down there, take the time to go down there and check it out. And I, and I would just echo John. I mean, it's just such an amazing opportunity for science, but also for all of us as Coloradans. Um, and uh, I just am really happy to be a part of this and had, had, had the chance to offer a few thoughts. And I just want to thank Chris and everybody else for the hard work to make this happen. It's truly incredible. It makes me very proud to be a Coloradan. Gosh, thanks guys. This is kind of slapping each other on the back type of a thing here because you know, to me, none of this happens without a deeper understanding. When we talk about a place for nature today and a way for it to move to wherever it needs to go over time, and your, your work shows, I mean, nature isn't in the same place tomorrow as it is today. It's going to be moving in that biogeographic pattern. The information that we get, all we can do is set that template in place, and I think this is a great example of it. I want to thank everybody for showing up for this. Uh, wish you could all be in the field and we could be taking trips out there. Of course, with this many people, we probably hurt some things. But uh, thank you very much for coming and spending your time uh, for the museum. Thanks for hosting it very much. Yes, thank you all. We'll see you next week, Wednesday night, if you can join us. Thanks to all of our panelists, um, to Jessa and Aaron as well, who are behind the scenes. Have a great night, everybody.